Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the Meet the CEO with Webit Nano's CEO, Kobi Hanoff. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Ron Bechler. I'm with Atomic Markets. A um, bit of housekeeping before we start. If you have a question, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation that Kobi will be giving. So please put your question in the Q&A box down the bottom, and I'll moderate the questions at the end of the presentation. I might hand the microphone across to Kobi to take us through the Q1 FY23 uh, update on Webit. It's been a very busy quarter and uh, a lot been going on. So I look forward to hearing the presentation and then we'll, we'll move on to Q&A off the back of that. Thanks, Kobi. Okay, thanks, Ron. Yes, it has been a very busy quarter and uh, so, you know, really a lot of activity and ramping up to even more activity in the upcoming quarter. Um, you know, last quarter, we had uh, several key milestones. Of course, uh, the most important one was announced recently with the qualification of, uh, of our RERAM, uh, showing that we meet the industry standard requirements for uh, production quality. And, and that's, uh, that's gotten very good response uh, throughout. Uh, you know, the selector, again, another announcement that was done uh, recently. Uh, this is something that's happening in the background, but nevertheless, we're continuing to develop the selector. And, and this time, we even managed to show that we can use it in embedded applications, which is going to be a, another very important uh, uh, game changer, even, I can say. Uh, we're expecting the wafers back from Skywater now. Uh, you know, it was tape, taped out and, and it should be back uh, soon. Uh, we'll be doing the qualification there immediately after that. There's really good cooperation now with, um, with Skywater. And in general, there's really uh, more and more activity going on now uh, with partners, uh, uh, tier one uh, fabs and uh, really even uh, more advanced than I uh, expected uh, in uh, in the past. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you know, if you look back uh, a year, and I actually look back five years since I joined uh, five years ago, it was it's really amazing to see uh, all the stuff that we managed to do. But uh, in the last year, we. Uh, uh, we announced that we reached 28 nanometers, and then uh, we already are working on the 22. As you know, uh, we're planning to uh, tape out also on 22 nanometers. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the module, we showed that it was fully functional, and we did the tape out to Skywaters. And now with the, the two uh, recent releases, uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of uh, the progress made uh, over this past year. Uh, talking about qualification, and it's really important uh, to, to explain what qualification is and why it's so important. Um, qualification is, is a process that's defined by uh, industry standards. Uh, you know, we, we took the definition of JEDEC, which is the common one for non-volatile memories, um, it defines, uh, you know, a, a really, you know, detailed uh, testing procedure that you need to go to. Now it's, uh, you know, you need to do three separate manufacturing lots. So three times go through manufacturing. Uh, from each one of those lots, you take different wafers. From each one of the wafers, you take uh, random dyes. Uh, overall, it's been many, many hundreds of dyes that we tested, uh, and it's very rigorous testing for each one of those, uh, going through all kinds of stress measurements. Uh, you know, the highlight is, of course, that uh, when you put them in, in ovens that go up to uh, very high temperatures and, and check that the chips are still working. So it's really a very rigorous procedure that takes many months to complete. Uh, because of that. Uh, but once you do complete it, you have a certification. Uh, you can show the results to customers, to other fabs, to, you know, partners. And, and uh, you can show them that, yeah, we passed it. All of these hundreds of chips, all of them passed it. All of them are acting the same. You know, when we do mass uh, production, 
all of them will act the same. You won't have different chips doing different things or all kinds of things like that. So that's uh, that's really a, a very important milestone. And Letty, you know, some people tell me, oh, Letty is an R&D fab, but Letty's facilities are state of the art. They are top notch, like the most advanced fabs in the world. Um, not many fabs in the world, not many foundries in the world have the ability to work at 28 or, or 22 nanometers. I mean, I think the number is uh, maybe a dozen at best, and Letty is one of them. So it's, it's really an advanced facility, and these tests do impress many people. And uh, uh, they actually enabled us to engage with uh, much more advanced uh, fabs. We're talking now to, to tier one fabs, uh, making good progress with some of them and uh, showing the results to customers that are also uh, impressed by the results. So really a very exciting uh, milestone that we achieved. Uh, now this is uh, a milestone that, uh, you know, we're immediately continuing to do qualification on even more rigorous and more extreme results. You know, the, the way that you do the qualification is you start at, at a certain level and then you keep pushing the limits and you keep uh, going to higher temperatures and more endurance. And, and uh, you know, you just keep showing that the technology can withstand mass production at even more extreme results. So we're continuing uh, to do that work and additional uh, qualification even at more rigorous um, uh, requirements. Um, I mentioned the selector, uh, you know, the people that have been following Webit know that uh, we are working on this technology uh, uh, in the background. Uh, this is a technology which originally we focused on for discrete or standalone chips. And you know, in in stand in the standalone world, small memory uh, memory dots we call them small memory cells uh, are really a, a key requirement. You need to shrink the size of the array as much as you can. It's real estate, just like any other real estate. You want to have as much as as much memory as you can on as small uh, a piece of silicon as you can, and the selector is an enabler to that. Uh, I'm very happy that the team found a way to make this work even in uh, embedded. So uh, you know, we uh, uh, we are looking at in the future, not now because it still isn't uh, ready, but we will be looking at how we can use it also in the embedded applications and get uh, another uh, advantage over uh, over competition, over other kinds of uh, memory by shrinking the memory arrays, even in embedded applications. Um, and, you know, this is looking uh, very good, especially for applications that will need uh, very large memories, uh, even in embedded like AI and automotive. Um, and, and it's really important because uh, we also are managing to make the selector uh, be use standard materials, uh, which is really not trivial. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to see additional progress uh, on this front. Uh, Skywater, of course, is is a key activity for us. Uh, you know, we went through a long process of transferring the technology to them, uh, doing the tape out, uh, and then you know having to wait uh, for the wafers. The wafers are now, uh, you know, moving very fast. Uh, I believe we'll be getting them uh, in the near future. We should be getting them, we, you know, clearly before the end of the year. Um, and as soon as we get them, we'll go immediately into qualification. Um, qualification is, uh, uh, is moving forward, will move forward uh, well. So by uh, uh, by the beginning of uh, next year and the first half of next year, uh, we'll be expecting to finalize it. And, um, and we'll be, uh, uh, we're already talking to um, uh, Skywater customers. We're, uh, we're working with them. If some of you guys look at their website, you will see that there's a page for, uh, wee bit there 
and um, really good cooperation going on now. Um, in terms of uh, the market engagement, so I mentioned uh, we, uh, we have really nice uh, results with the qualification. We've already shown intermediate results to, uh, to other fabs. I think that what's really happening right now is the market is realizing that this is the time for uh, reram. You know, a year ago, two years ago, when I would talk to people, they would always say, oh, yeah, that future uh, technology, that emerging technology that will be available sometime. Uh, you know, today, I think the market realizes RERAM is here. Uh, everyone needs it. They're asking for it. We've had um, more than one case where uh, an advanced, a tier one fab told us they lost a major deal with a major customer because they didn't have advanced enough non-volatile memory. They showed us the specifications and, you know, we put them next to our RERAM and, and you can see the match. Um, we've, uh, we've seen, uh, especially since TSMC, which is the largest fab, um, announced that they have a, uh, a RERAM technology. Uh, it really sent a shockwave, I think, through the industry. Everyone now needs to have a, a RERAM technology to compete with TSMC. And the, you know, when they look around, you know, <laughs> Webit is basically, uh, you know, the key, the key one that they see. So, uh, so we have these engagements now, and it's uh, really exciting to to talk to all of these guys and move forward. And some of them are already in different stages of uh, evaluating the technology. So really um, uh, looking uh, very, uh, I, I try to be cautious in, in the world, in my words, but it really is looking nice. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's the activity there. We're also talking to uh, potential customers, of course, and pushing them forward in parallel uh, you know, there's this situation, as, as you guys know, uh, this triangle between us, the customer that will want to embed our technology in their chip, and then the fab, and different customers use different fabs, and they want us to work with specific fabs or things like that. Uh, you know, we need to get these triangles formed, and there's, you know, a lot of work to be done here to, to do that, to push that forward, uh, but uh, there's constant progress. Uh, and of course, we've been uh, attending a lot of um, conferences, both technical conferences, and you know, I've been involved in some uh, uh, investor conferences, and uh, our name is, is really out there now. Um, and even when you look, you know, I said the world is realizing that now is the time for RERAM. I think nothing, nothing exemplifies it more than the report from Yol. I consider Yol uh, the number one analyst for, uh, for our market. And uh, these guys uh, in the past were more uh, cautious, but now uh, you know, they basically have the embedded RERAM market you can see here going from practically zero, which is uh, today, to about a billion US dollars in just a few years. Um, I think that, you know, I can sense that this is what the market wants. This is the direction of the market. Um, I, uh, I clearly see uh, uh, the demand here. And, uh, you know, over the next uh, few years, as we roll the technology out to more fabs and, and engage with more customers, uh, there's the, the famous book about the tipping point, and you get to that point where you have several new customers, they're having good results, and then suddenly, you know, that whole thing tips over and, and you know, you have the flood coming. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So basically, uh, you know, looking forward and, uh, you know, I'm looking at uh, what are our goals. You know, we need to look forward further than just another month or two. And so we're looking at the targets uh, until the middle of next year. Of course, you know, I mentioned we need to conclude the qualification of uh, the embedded uh, RERAM at uh, Skywater. That's going to be a key activity. We'll get the wafers and we'll start the qualification. Um, you know, we're having, we're making good progress with tier one fabs and, and I really set the goal for the, the team that uh, we need to have uh, 
you know, a big advanced fab already licensing our technology by the middle of next year. Of course, with customers, we're continuing the work. We, you know, we said we'll uh, close uh, customer agreements um, and, and we are working on it very strongly uh, to push that forward. And uh, I want to see uh, uh, more, uh, more of this activity and, and seeing actual uh, uh, customers uh, signing licensing agreements. Um, we will be, I'm I was talking about continuing the qualification and we do plan to continue qualification, take it to more and more extreme uh, levels uh, to show, you know, real superiority. Today, uh, by the way, today our qualification already uh, shows uh, that we are uh, better than uh, Flash and, and, you know, moving forward, we want to show real superiority in, in this domain and, um, you know, very strong results. And then, you know, scaling to 22, and, and we're actually already working on even below 22, you know, and I, I mentioned people don't understand these numbers. 22 nanometers, there's, you know, a dozen at most, I think, uh, fabs that are capable of working at 22. You go down below that and it's even, you know, it, it even becomes more extreme. So, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing it. We're pushing the limits there. We want to get to the places where the most advanced designs are and, uh, you know, including AI and automotive and all the, the really advanced things. So there's really a lot of work going on there um, and continued R&D. You know, that's the heart of it all, pushing the technology further, uh, making the reram cell smaller, making the reram cell more advanced. A lot of work, a lot of work. Uh, we have an amazing team and I'm really excited about all of this. So that's, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, we can stop here and uh, open the floor uh, uh, to questions. Thanks, Kobe. Um, a lot going on over the last quarter and obviously a busy run into the end of FY23. We've got a bunch of questions that have come in and we'll try and cover as many as we can in the time allotted. Um, just to remind everybody, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Um, we've got too many participants on the line to try and open up people's windows to ask questions. Um, maybe if we turn to, first of all, that slide that you like referencing, slide eight, which is the YOL market share slide. Can you just talk through, you said RERAM is expected market share of 33% of that $957 million annual market size. We got a question asking what's the what's the corresponding sixty seven percent. So uh, by the way, it, it wasn't wee bit uh, market share. Uh, Yol was looking at the total market for emerging uh, non volatile memories. The two leading technologies are MRAM and RERAM. MRAM being magnetic RAM. Uh, MRAM has been in the market already. Uh, for some time, uh, it's actually out in the market first. Uh, so there are companies now that are commercially selling MRAM. Uh, and, and so Yol has looked at it and, and estimates that MRAM will have two thirds of the market and RERAM will have one third. So what you saw on that slide is the RERAM part of it. Uh, I personally can tell you that as we talk more and more to uh, fabs and to customers uh, that are already using uh, MRAM, we're getting, you know, a very clear message, I can say, that people are not happy with MRAM. MRAM is way too complex to manufacture. Um, it is, uh, it is non-standard in its extremity. You cannot manufacture MRAM inside the fab. You need to have a separate facility for it. Uh, the magnetic material is a, is a terrible contaminant in the fab. And so, uh, you know, we're getting the indications. And then, by the way, you have so many layers there and everything. They, MRAM adds about 30 to 40 percent to the wafer cost. We add about 5, 7 percent to the wafer cost. So you can understand just commercially when people will get to it, we, we don't require new tools and new materials like MRAM requires. We're much simpler and easier, cost-effective, 
So I believe that that two thirds uh, MRAM, one third RERAM will actually change to the RERAM side and, and we'll see a much stronger RERAM side once uh, Webit is really in mass production. I think um, the point to make also is the market opportunity is so large that and there won't be one specific winner that it doesn't it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. The opportunity is so large that you know even a you know a ten or twenty percent share of that overall market is still massive. You don't need mm -hmm. to have fifty percent share to be you know happy with the outcome oh. for the company. As as you all wrote there, uh, thirty three percent is one billion dollars, which is a pretty nice growth rate already. It's it's very hard to grow faster than that, anyway. Yeah. And uh, and it doesn't stop there; it keeps going. The market is huge. Uh, we're talking about both MRAM and RERAM growing uh, rapidly. Um, we've got a few questions around nodes, sizes, and qualifications, and so on. But maybe just a question for those that are slightly newer on this webinar. Um, can you just outline what exactly is qualification and why is it so important to a company like Webit? Okay. Um, so first of all, we, we use the terms, and I apologize, you know, in the industry, there are a few terms which are used interchangeably quite a bit, you know, nodes, geometries, uh, nanometers, they all refer to the same thing, basically. So when I when I say a small geometry, I'm talking about something that is smaller than 22 nanometers. Uh, you know, similarly, when I say small nodes, I try not to use the term node just to confuse people less. Um, so, and, and as I mentioned, uh, the market has been going down steadily. There's Moore's law for those who know it. And uh, uh, the everything has been shrinking. Uh, I saw, a month ago, I saw an announcement that Samsung is planning by 2027 to be manufacturing at 1.4 nanometers. <laughs> it's just like, I, I, it's uh, uh, not understandable at all. I mean, I, I just can't understand how they can do that, but uh, you know, the market keeps shrinking. Um, and, and the number of companies that can really work in these small geometries, as I mentioned, is very, very small. Um, it's really a challenge. Um, so we're, you know, we're pushing forward. You asked about qualification, and as I explained, um, it really, it really is the best indication the market can get that we're ready for mass production. So, uh, by the way, I had people say, "Wait a minute, what do you mean that WeBit is the only one out there now?" And and you know, I maybe talking a little bit about the competitive landscape. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, there were really four smaller companies that were focused on RERAM. Uh, you know, Crossbar was maybe the leading one. They were already working with production fabs, et cetera. But the problem was that they were using non-standard materials. Uh, they raised, you know, 150, close to 150 uh, million US dollars. But at the end of the day, they didn't manage to get it working. And some Chinese fund took over. And, you know, we don't see them in the market anymore. Uh, there was another company called Adesto that... Uh, was acquired by uh, Dialog. Uh, that, I guess it had several products. Dialog acquired them, and then Dialog was acquired by a, a big Japanese company called Renesas. And Renesas doesn't have any focus on memory or, or anything. So the RERAM technology there has kind of been put aside. And and Webit now is is really the the leading player in the market. So we're very happy that you know the spotlight is on us. Uh, the qualification results show that uh, we've passed where the others were, and now we're in a in a good position, ready to go, and, and doing this move to the commercialization. Thanks, Kobe. And just to confirm, the qualification that was recently announced, um, what uh, node was that done at? That was uh, on the 130 nanometer uh, technology from Letty. Those are the wafers that we did. Uh, if you remember uh, a year ago, uh, uh, we, uh, we manufactured uh, wafers uh, for 130, the, the modules. And so that's what we, we tested. And the 130 is what Skywater is starting with as well. Yes, yeah, we will. The Skywater manufacturing is also at 130, so we'll be qualifying there. Uh, we are 
taping out soon at 22. And uh, we'll, you know, of course, we'll have to wait until those wafers will get out of the fab. But once they'll get out of the fab, we'll be starting to qualify those. And, and that's already going to be a much more advanced one. Yeah. And then, and then the qualification that was done, you mentioned in Letty's fab. And so... No, a qualification, qualification is done in special labs. Actually, most of the qualification was done in our lab. We set up a lab in our office. Uh, a lot of it was done in our lab, and then we uh, uh, we worked with um, specialized labs that have the specialized ovens and, and everything to do uh, uh, to do that work. So uh, qualification was actually done by by Webit's team in Israel mostly. Okay, and then the, the you mentioned about the plans to tape out at twenty two nanometers. Will that be um, done? within Letty's fab or would some other fab be involved? No, that's uh, that's with uh, with one of the tier one fabs. Uh, that's gonna be done at a, at a fab of one of the big fabs. Okay, and you mentioned tier one and tier two fabs that um, the company is talking to. Um, are the tier one and the tier two looking at different node sizes in terms of what they wanting from Webit or it's, it's just a, they're not so worried about 130 or 22. Like, how are they thinking about it in terms of their engagement with you? Um, normally, when we talk about tier one, we're talking about the ones that are going below 28. You know, going to 28 and below, uh, that requires huge investments, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars uh, and even more. Uh, that requires, uh, you know, really... Uh, mass production to justify all those costs. Some of the tier one fabs also work at large geometries. So some of them work at, at 180 and, and even, you know, beyond 180, 130, et cetera. So, uh, but some of them also really have a big focus on just the smaller geometries. It's kind of across the board, but the key element here is when you go below 28 nanometers, you need to have very, very deep pockets and, and uh, you know, uh, really mass production. Um, we've got some questions that came in from people that weren't able to be on this, but they've emailed it through. Um, and looking at um, embedded and discrete, there's a question around what prospects are there for moving discrete as in standalone technology forward now that the selector has been tested? And what do you need to do in development for it? Um, the selector technology, uh, I mentioned it when we started working on it. It's a, it's a very, very complex technology. Uh, we're going through different stages of development um, and, and there still is more work to be done there. So I don't want to confuse people. It's, you know, we went through a certain important milestone, but there still is... Uh, in order to get the selector technology to the point where it can be qualified, we still have a lot of work to do. And so then when you think about <clears throat> sales avenues outside of embedded, that's further down the track as well. Yeah, I think I always said that the near term low hanging fruit is, uh, is embedded. That is my big focus. That is where the initial revenue will come from. And, and we're focused on that. Uh, the discrete is a big market, but it requires the selector, and that's going to be the midterm. And you know, I always said the longer term will be more morphic. So that's kind of uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, we're very focused right now on getting revenues from the embedded and and the uh, the selector technology and the discrete is continuing in the background. We've had a couple of questions around some of the previous conversations on partnerships and letters of intent and so on that were talked about in terms of the Indian Institute of Technology Delhi on the Neuromorphic Project, XTX, Cyan. Can you give us an update on how those various collaborations are progressing? So uh, I think I'll, I'll break that question into two questions. Um, you know, the uh, IIT Delhi and also Politecnico de Milano and, and other research institutes and the Technion in Israel, uh, those are institutes, those are research institutes that we're working with them on uh, the neuromorphic technology, 
neuromorphic and, and processing in memory and, and other advanced technologies. And, and that's going very well. Uh, every once in a while, we announce a paper. Actually, with IIT Delhi, we I think there was a paper in, in a conference just uh, a month or two months ago. Uh, so that's, that's progressing very nicely. Uh, China is a very good question, and I think it's uh, it's a question that should be answered on its own. I think everyone here is aware of what's happening in China with the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China. I will add that you know during the Corona period, it was very very difficult to work with China. You you couldn't travel to China. Communication was more difficult. So you know both of those things have pushed us to, I mean, we managed to get an agreement with Skywater, and that was a, a key step forward. And that, you know, we're now in, in discussions with many, uh, I guess I can call it Western uh, foundries, Western customers. Uh, you know, that market is, is huge. Uh, uh, and right now we're focused on that. I think it's, uh, I'm looking for ways to lower the risk for WeBit and I'm sensing that uh, uh, it is uh, lower risk and, and higher potential for us to focus on US, Europe, Western world. And, uh, you know, it's not like we totally cut off our ties in China, but uh, uh, we're, we're clearly not uh, pushing strongly there. And by the way, you still can't travel to China. So it's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I'm very happy with where we are today. It gave us a huge push with, with the big fabs uh, in the Western world. Um, cyber threats and cyber risks have become quite topical here in Australia off the back of some recent news flow. Can you... Outline to us how Webit's memory technology helps improve cybersecurity. Um, there are actually several ways. Um, the the reram technology, first of all, many of the cyber applications are such that you know require AI and and so on, and, and they want to go down to the small geometries. And you know they go down to to 22, 16, 12, and and even smaller than that. As I mentioned many times, flash does not scale to those geometries. It gets stuck at at 40, you know, 28. If you really push it, and it's not economical already. So what they need to do is they have to have a separate chip for non-volatile memory that's kind of. Uh, you know, glued on to the, the main chip and, and so on. But the mere fact that you have separate chips opens, you know, a communication line between those chips to eavesdropping. And, and that's one, one area of concern of people. Uh, in, in embedded RERAM, you don't have that. We are embedded in the chip. We're an integral part of the chip. So that's one of the advantages uh, that we have. Uh, WeBit is also, I mean, our technology is uh, immune to, to interferences. You know, I, I mentioned MRAM before, and, and one of the concerns about MRAM is that because it's magnetic, if, if you go near a, a strong magnetic field, uh, you know, things can be erased or things can be altered. Uh, you know, if people are smart enough, they'll find ways to do it even in other ways. Uh, RERAM is inherently immune to radiation, uh, which is another uh, point. So we we have several advantages in the security space, and 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 some security companies are actually looking at that. Um, keeping it sort of the high level, and we've talked about cyber risk. What about quantum computing? Do, do our chips have a role in quantum computing? Um, it's a uh, very exciting uh, memory technology. Sorry, not actually. Uh, memory, memory. Yeah, yeah, because uh, there's also the embedded uh, quantum computing is very exciting, um, but at this point, at least, it's it's a different kind of technology, and we don't really have um, uh, we don't really have uh, a role to play there uh, in quantum computing. So you know, we're looking at it out of personal curiosity, but that's not where Webit is heading now. Um, if we think about, and you, you had that slide at the end about, you know, key milestones to deliver over the remainder of FY23, I've got a question that's come in that's asked, what other technology developments are we expecting? For example, qualifications at higher standards, um, 
smaller nodes. Can you give a bit of a sense of how you're thinking about where you want to take the technology over the remainder of this financial year? Um, so we're, we're constantly pushing the envelope. Um, and also th there are two directions. First of all, just pushing the envelope and second, taking what we have and making it robust so that it can go to mass production. Those are two parallel activities that we're working on. Uh, so I, I talked about qualification, you know, at this point, the qualification was done at what's called industrial grade. Um, we're now starting qualification for automotive grade, uh, for more advanced, you know, the, the requirements in terms of temperatures, endurance, et cetera, are more extreme. Um, and, and we'll be pushing that, you know, there, there are multiple grades of, of qualification that you can get to, uh, we we're confident that we can go, uh, you know, several grades forward already. We have very high confidence that we can achieve those. You know, the question is how far and, and that's where the other activity comes in of, uh, making the technology more robust, uh, you know, and uh, without going into the technical details, but, um, you want to make, um, you know, when you, uh, the memory at the end is is chemistry and you know you have atoms and and all of that in there and when you write a one or you write a zero into the memory it's not digital it's analog and and you want to make sure that the differentiation between a zero and a one is strong enough and wide enough so that it's very obvious and and then you can do a lot more things so uh, so we're constantly pushing to to make, you know, the zero and the one more distinct, you know, uh, a wider gap between them, uh, which will enable us to move forward to more extreme um, qualification levels and so on. So there's there's really a lot of work on all of that, just making the technology more robust. And, and you know, that's, that's something that's never ending, by the way. That's something that it won't end in, in five years or, or in, I don't know what, you, you have to keep constantly pushing the technology uh, to, to give better and better and better results because that's what the market wants. In addition, uh, as I said, we're, we're working now, there's a big focus on the 22 nanometer. We're already, uh, analyzing uh, geometries which are lower than that and, and working um, with some of the, the tier one fabs on, on looking at how we can go down uh, to smaller geometries and, and we'll be pushing in that direction. The whole market is pushing in that direction. Uh, so a lot of very interesting work. Um, you mentioned some of the low hanging fruit and the focus on embedded. Got a question that's come in on the embedded selector. Can you explain what types of markets it will excel in and if the embedded selector can actually create whole new markets and products? Um, an embedded selector has several really important uh, advantages. The, the most important one, of course, is just size. Uh, the selector uh, enables you to generate to build a much larger array on a much smaller piece of silicon. So the, uh, in other words, on the same piece of silicon, you can put a lot more memory, which is actually what most people are looking for. AI is the type of application that no matter how much memory you give them, they always want more. So if we on the same piece of silicon that they have reserved for memory can give them more memory, um, this is huge for them. That That is a, a very big advantage. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. Um, another thing which is, you know, really further out, but something that uh, we, we are looking at, uh, once you start using the selector, you can actually start thinking of three-dimensional. You know, people here have heard in the past that there's 3D NAND and the way that Flash is dealing with the fact that it can't shrink is it's going up now. It's They're building skyscrapers of memory and on the same piece of silicon, they have more and more memory just because they pack it in, in piles. We actually, with a selector, we will uh, potentially be able to do the same thing and start going three-dimensional. So uh, those are further away uh, milestones. It's not something that will happen tomorrow. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. Uh, but uh, getting the selector to work embedded, once it works and, and it's ready for mass production and then getting it into the embedded will open 
uh, will make us much more competitive because we'll be able to have uh, much more memory on the same piece of silicon and uh, potentially even go three-dimensional at a certain point. Um, we have a question that's come in and I'll say the question, but I'll then rephrase it because it's a bit hard to actually answer. And the question is, if everything goes according to plan, when do you estimate mass production will occur? Maybe I can just, because ultimately you don't know what's going to plan because we've gave an indication of, you know, timeframes and what you want to do by the end of FY23 in terms of signing up a new fab or a new customer. But let's just say we announce, WeBit announces that a new fab or a new customer has been signed up. Sort of roughly, what's the sort of time frame between that and actually having mass production start? Um, so first of all, you know the the first answer is with Skywater, we are moving forward and um, we're expecting the wafers, and then we'll do qualification. And you know we we still need to see how much time exactly that qualification will take, but it's you know order of magnitude of a few months. Uh, that we'll do it. We already did qualification once. By the way, that's another advantage of the fact that we did qualification on the Letty wafers. We kind of now have that experience and, and we know what we need to do with Skywater. So uh, uh, we're hoping to have uh, uh, to have that qualification done uh, even a little bit faster. Um, and then once we're qualified, we can go into mass production. But the, the other side of the story, and I always talk about this triangle, you know, you have the fab and the fab needs to be ready, but then you need the customers and the customers to come on board. The customers today, and especially, you know, the, the, the atmosphere in the semiconductor space is, is um, you know, it's uh, a little reserved, I would say, you know, the, uh, whoever's been following the semiconductor market, uh, the big uh, players have had uh, uh, challenges and, and share prices and everything. So, so there is even more hesitancy than normal, but, you know, the, we are moving forward with them. We are making progress. Uh, we're now working with Skywater, talking to several of their customers, about adopting our technology. Uh, those customers, uh, once they embed the technology into their design, now they need to design their product with our memory in it and get it ready for tape out. And that takes several months, that can take a year, depending on the design. Uh, and then they go to mass production. So that's kind of the order of magnitude to give you the feeling with uh, Skywater. Uh, and you can follow the the process we did with Skywater since we signed the agreement and and so on with the larger fabs. I expect things to be to go faster, um, transferring the technology, getting things done, uh, not not uh, orders of magnitude faster, but clearly both we have more experience and the larger fabs have more resources to put on it and, and push things faster. So. Um, you know, it's, uh, the answer is it's, it's a ramp up, uh, to get to mass production. You need to close an agreement with the, the fab, transfer the technology, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, as you guys know, can take a few months and then you do the tape out, you wait for the wafers and you get it back, you do the qualification. Um, and in parallel, you work with customers. I think with the, as, as we move forward, we'll be able to bring more and more customers on board in parallel to the technology transfer um, and, and get things moving faster. In terms of the FY23 goals that you've set out today, what are the biggest challenges in, your, in the company's ability to achieve those aspirations or those goals for FY23? Uh, time. <laughs> we just, everything takes long and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very impatient person. So this drives me nuts. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, semi I don't know what I'm doing in semiconductors, but that's the way it works. Uh, so uh, in semiconductors, you know, you send wafers for manufacture and you just have to sit there for many months. And if, you know, if they rush them through uh, the fab and everything, uh, you know, you can get, get it in, you know, maybe a a little bit faster, but no matter how you look at it, it's, you know, it takes a lot of time. So I think one of the key things is things just take time. Uh, we're also in a period where the customers, because of what's happening in the marketplace, um, you know, and, and we're hearing uh, uh, 
uh, about companies, uh, uh, you know, that their results, uh, as semiconductor companies are looking at the results and everything. Uh, you know, if, if normally they're very cautious, now you, you can, th there's a little more of that obstacle to overcome. We're pushing it. Uh, I know we'll make it. Uh, I don't, I don't have doubts that we'll, we'll, we will get those customers on board and we will get those fabs. Uh, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit more of a challenge, but we're making good progress with them. We have uh, very, very exciting talks with some of them and it's going to be, you know, for me, it's, it's really a very exciting period right now. Maybe on that note, because we've hit 45 minutes and we're running out of time. Um, we might wrap up uh, this uh, Meet the CEO interview. There's obviously going to be a lot of opportunities for people to meet with you, ask you questions face to face in a couple of weeks' time when you come out to Australia. Um, so, just for those online, looking forward to it. <laughs> we're looking forward to it too. It's been almost three years, Cobby, but um, we've got you in Sydney on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which is the, I'm just checking the dates now, 14th to the 16th of November. Melbourne on the 17th and 18th of November, and then Perth on the 21st of November. So if anyone, and there's a series of um, events both in, in Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth for a group briefing for investors. And I think, Kobe, you're also, you're obviously presenting at um, Tech Ops this week and potentially another conference while you're out here. We're just waiting on confirmation. Um, so there's a lot of activities going on in the AGM, um, but we'd certainly encourage shareholders or potential shareholders to take advantage of Kobe and Daddy, David Perlmutter, uh, the chairman, will be out at the same time in a couple of weeks to meet with them face to face, come to the briefings and hear more about Webit, the technology and the growth opportunities that uh, lie ahead. Um, Kobe, maybe just on that note, if you'd like to just wrap up and leave us with a thought before we finish up today. That would be great. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, as I said, it's very exciting times for Webit. Uh, you guys have seen, we have several um, key milestones ahead of us with, you know, waiting for the uh, Skywater wafers, with taping out to 22, with, you know, there's more activity, of course, the customer activity and everything. Really exciting times. Uh, for me, it's very exciting to come back to uh uh, Australia after, you know, it's almost three years now. It's it's getting close to three years. Uh, you know, I really miss it. I really look forward to to meeting people face to face. And, and uh, uh, so I, I would love to have all of you guys uh, come to these briefings and, and meet you in person. And, um, and Daddy will be with me, which is also, uh, I think, uh, uh, an important point. Uh, so together, uh, we'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, looking forward to it. Kobe, thank you very much. And to everyone online, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Have a great rest of day. And hopefully we'll see you all when Kobe and Daddy are out here in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye.